now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. John Bodiger. Um, John is um, very connected to the spirit of the New Deal, and um, he's the grandson of Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, John is on the advisory board of the Living New Deal, to which he lends his amazing and generous spirit. And he's a dear friend to me. So please welcome John, who will open our conference. Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, very happy to be the requisite Roosevelt. <laughs> Higher? Yes? I'm happy to be the requisite Roosevelt. I said there actually is at least one more in the, in the room. Two more. There's my son Joshua. Um, I realized in, in being assigned the theme of, of the, the spirit of my grandmother, Eleanor, that um, as I began to take notes, I was taking notes more about her childhood and early years, and then about, the, the, um, about her 50s and 60s, when arguably she had her greatest impact on the life of the world. Um, what did I miss in the course of that emphasis, collection of two emphases? Well, the New Deal. <laughs> For which my apologies that will be more than made up by what succeeds this. I think my, my, the first thought I had was that my grandmother was among those that William James called the twice born. And those who uh, have experienced a renewal, a personal transformation after enduring trauma, loss, that could have buried the gift of a loving life, but didn't. In fact, Whatever it is, I call it almost a rebirthing, drew her into an adulthood, the time when I knew her best, that nourished all of us and <coughs> led her to be recognized as one of the great women of the 20th century. So for the next few minutes, I want to share with you uh, some memories, some reflections, and if I can make these slides work, some pictures. This is uh, when, when the Hyde Park Roosevelt's had their first reunion after Grandmère died. Um, it was 1980, and I, and I, I, I was that meeting Susan Ives. Uh, well, I couldn't have been that. But, but I put it together, and I put it everybody's place at the first dinner, this picture. Because this, this is Eleanor Roosevelt at age 18. And not only does it give the lie to, to those who thought her in those years playing, but um, it was something that I wanted to have at everybody's place when the Hyde Park Roosevelt's gathered, the Democratic side of the Roosevelt's gathered <laughs> together. <coughs> well, I said, like, like all of her grandchildren, at least in those days, my name for my grandmother was Grand Mère. She learned French through her sometimes sympathetic, sometimes anything but sympathetic caretakers some of whom were French. She learned French, uh, I think, with, with the alacrity and the success with which she learned English. 
We said goodbye to each other the day before she died. She was 78. She was suffering from cardiac failure. She'd had an astonishingly moving, full life. And she was decidedly impatient to leave. She was not only my grandmother, she was my first and my best mentor. I think her values did more to shape my own than those of any other single person. So I'm grateful, especially for the years that we spent living together. There are the two sort of bookends. Hmm? What, is, what, is, what do we say about at, at some age we become responsible for our own faces? <laughs> In my years as a child, she was grand mère. I knew her as a grandmother, a loving, tender, wise elder. For myself, my half-sister and half-brother, my parents, Anna and John. She made lots of visits to our home on Mercer Island in the middle of Lake Washington, outside of Seattle. She held my mother's hand as I was being born. When my father, who was also John Bodiger, but because partly of his sense that he really wasn't ready to become a father, he wanted to be sure that I had a middle name, so I was not John Bodiger Jr. When he left for combat in World War II, I knew her when, when my mother and I, in response to a call from my mother's father, my grandfather, Franklin, who said, Sis, it's her name for, his name for her, I know you, John's gone, why don't you and Johnny come and live with me? with us in the White House. So we did. We came east, and for the remainder of, of the war, from the end of 1941 through April of 1945, I was, I had the distinction, the, 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 the privileges, and, and the loneliness of being the only child in the White House. The, the third floor was my domain. That, that and, the, and a bewildering collection of nannies that, that I had no sense of. You know, when I think of the essence of her spirit, I, I think of a word that uh, is simple and plain, whose value is that it's the word that mo she used most commonly to describe her, her spirit, her sense of her spirit, her care for others' lives. That word is useful. She wanted to be useful. And I think virtually everything that I'll say from here on in is is implicit or will become explicit in her determination to succeed as she so richly did. When using that word to describe herself, to assess herself and her service on others' behalf, she held herself to a pretty high bar. 
and served those she loved, those for whom she worked untiringly in the wider world, the poor, those ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-nourished, who suffered from racism, imprisonment, <coughs> even death by lynching, as well as just ordinary folks like us who are trying to make a viable and meaningful life for themselves. She worked for all of those. She worked for all of those with an energy that, that exhausted and, exp and inspi inspired those of us much younger than she. I was there to hear words spoken in eulogy about her. Let's see if I can do this. These are the early visits that I mentioned. My brother, my sister, myself growing up between them my grandmother. This is the White House. This was Christmas, roughly, Christmas 1944, when I think F FDR, in a, in a, what, in a premonitory sense that his time on this earth was coming to a close. Um, maybe not that, maybe simply because he wanted to gather his family around him. You see, the, it's not altogether clear, but you see the expression on his face? I mean, just the sense of pleasure in the gathering. Um, I am front and center. <laughs> Look, looking a little bewildered. Maybe even a little sad. Adlai Stevenson said to the General Assembly first, you remember he was appointed by John Kennedy as the ambassador to the United Nations. He was ambassador to the UN when, when my grandmother died. And he said first to the General Assembly and second to his, her memorial service at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. Essentially the very similar words. He told the General Assembly that he said that he had, that I, I'm reading his words now, I have lost more than a friend. I've lost an inspiration. For she would rather light candles than curse the darkness. And her glow has warmed the world. My country mourns, he told the General Assembly, and I know that all in this assembly mourn with us. And he added something that has always been meaningful to me. In no small way, he said, the United Nations itself is a memorial to her and to her aspirations. To it, I'm still reading Adlai Stevenson. She gave the last 15 years of her restless spirit, her labors, her love, her ideals. Ideals, he said, that made her only weeks after Franklin Roosevelt's death on April 12, 1945, put aside all thoughts of peace and quiet after the tumult of their lives to serve as a, one of the delegates to the United Nations. Her duty, said Stevenson, then as always was to the living, to peace, to the world. 
It was her leadership, Stevenson said, that helped the world after years of painstaking travail. She produced, not single-handedly, but overwhelmingly. It was the first time, I don't know, maybe the only time, that the General Assembly of the United Nations rose in applause. And I remember a second sort of serendipitous event. It must have been in, in 1958 when I was living with her in her home in Hyde Park, Val Kill. I was browsing through her library upstairs and, and I came across a book by an historian named Stuart Brown called Adlai Stevenson, Conscience in Politics. And I opened it and, and saw on the inside the flyleaf an inscription to Eleanor Roosevelt, my conscience, Adlai Stevenson. One of the, one of the few aspects I think of, of Grand Mare's uh, life that, that has, I think, been underplayed by her biographers has been her sense of humor. She comes across, I think, in too many accounts as knowing and wise, but somehow sober. I don't mean that. Was also true. The most she had was a hot, watered down Dubonnet. <coughs> no one had heard, no, uh, no one would believe that she lacked a marvelous sense of humor. Who had ever heard her narrate Prokofiev's version of Peter of the Wolf? <laughs> nor anyone who sat around the table at her home, a rambunctious family dinner. In those, in those years, this was, of course, post-World War II, um, well after. She always led the toasts, and the first one was to the President of the United States to which she reliably added, I mean to the office. <laughs> Not necessarily the president incumbent. <laughs> well, I thought then, in order to fully share my memories of Grandmère's spirit, I need to share with you a particular story that cuts <coughs> close for me emotionally. Here's, here's the background. The foreground won't make sense to you until you've heard just a very brief summary of the background. My, my father, the last time that I spoke of was his departure for World War II. He saw combat in Sicily. First unit ashore in Italy, again, first unit ashore. He fought his way up through Allied forces, through Italy into Germany. He, he was a gifted reporter. He, he, was, he worked, he'd never been out of the Middle West before he met my mother. And he had, I don't think he had a political bone in his body, but he taught himself to write. And, and uh, he was a fine writer. He had written a series of stories for his then employer, the Chicago Tribune. <laughs> and the czar of the Tribune, one Colonel McCormick, said, John, this wonderful series of stories. 
You can have any job, maybe except mine, <laughs> at the Tribune. And my father said, this was in 1932, my father said, well, you know what I'd really love to do? I'd like to follow the campaign for the presidency of this extraordinary governor from the state of New York, Franklin <coughs> Delano Roosevelt. And it was on that campaign train that my parents met, fell in love, kissed between cars. <laughs> had, the, had the media been what the media is today, it might have changed the course of history. <laughs> he returned from the war with what we or what was then called battle fatigue, what is now known in, much more, in a much more sophisticated sense as PTSD, <coughs> compounding a lifetime fight with depression. Despite my mother's entreaties, he wouldn't seek treatment. In those days, truthfully, there was no effective treatment. We'd moved to, of all places, to try this experiment. We'd moved to Phoenix, Arizona, where my parents were determined to sink all of their resources and more into a brave but ill-starred effort to establish a liberal democratic newspaper. <laughs> the Arizona Times, which had a brief shelf life, but did in fact come to be, all too briefly. Wrong place, wrong time, deeper pocketed competition. in every sense of the word, financial, marital, psychological, especially for my father, the cost was too high. My parents' marriage broke under the spell, under the stress, rather. My mother Anna's greater resilience served her well, relocating us to Los Angeles, my father, hadn't her inner resourcefulness. He struggled with his pain for two years to find a way through, and in despair at the end of those two years, took his own life. He was 50, I was 11. Well, that's the background. Here's the foreground. Eight years later, I lived with my grandmother on vacations when I was an undergraduate at Amherst College. And uh, one day I'd written a paper about the United Nations, knowing her deep knowledge of the UN. Before departing for work that morning, I gave her my draft and I asked her if she had time to uh, take a look at it, let me know her thoughts when I returned home that evening. When I returned home, it, it wasn't that evening, it was maybe one or two in the morning. I expected to find her asleep. But she wasn't asleep. She was in her study. She was going through patiently a pile of letters that she dictated earlier in the day, adding, as was her wont and as she loved to do, small personal messages in handwritten messages. The only th two, two other things I remember from, come, come, from that homecoming, there was... Uh, 
there was a slow fire in the grate, so it must have been winter, New York City. Um, and uh, she was listening on the phonograph to Gregorian chants. I, I didn't say anything for it. I mean, it was like entering a space that, in which silence was um, important. And even as a young man, I had a sense of the truth of that. I finally did ask her, uh, Gromner, have you, have you read the draft? What, have you any thoughts that would help me finish it? And her reply touched a very deep and tender spot in my life. That she had the remarkable insight and love to understand. She said, yes, I did. And what struck me most was how your writing is like that of your father. I, I had no idea what to say. No one had seriously spoken to me about my father's death in the eight years since he died. How could she possibly know? I hardly knew it myself, how much my hunger for him remained. So she filled my silence. She said, Johnny, come, come over to the fire. Let's sit together and I'll tell you about him. How much she loved him, how much she admired his writing, how deeply she wished she could have done more to save my parents' marriage, to prevent my father's suicide. And I realized, probably not then, but, but on reflection that Gromer and I had experienced that at roughly the same age, she just before she was 10, just before she was 10, I, at age 11, the loss of a treasured and self-destructive father. I'm gonna catch up with the pictures. This is Douglas Shandor's beautiful portrait that has, you see that on the lower right, the smile that, uh, how, how do you capture a sense of humor without being with, with the person? Those are my parents at the time that they were struggling to create the Arizona Times, my father, my mother. The treasured and the self-destructive father, Elliot Bullock Roosevelt. And of course, my grandmother. Um, my grandmother recognized, not only in retrospect, but, but, but in, in uh, joining her mother, trying to join her mother, that her mother was an exceptionally beautiful woman. She loved to comb her hair. This is Anna Hall, Eleanor Roosevelt's mother. She remembered in, in her autobiographical writing that extraordinarily beautiful but reserved, stern, lacking empathy and understanding, minimal in performing the tasks of mothering, 
disappointed in her daughter's shyness and solemnity. Here are a few words that Rana wrote. I can remember, she said, standing in the door, very often with my finger in my mouth, which was, of course, forbidden. And I can see the look in my mother's eyes and hear the tone of her voice as she said, come in, Granny. If a visitor was there, she might turn and say, she's such a funny child, so old-fashioned that we call her Granny. I wanted to sink through the floor in shame. Anna Hall died of diphtheria at age 29 when her daughter was eight. So given her childhood, given her father Elliot's alcoholism and addiction to opium, many long absences from home and fruitless search for cure, and his own, what I guess I would call semi-suicidal death at age 34, given her mother's disregard and the strictures imposed on her by her grandmother, Hall, her mother's mother, to whom she was entrusted after her mother's death, it's not surprising that mothering did not come easily to Eleanor Roosevelt, especially when her children were young. She felt anxious responsibility, helplessness, dependency. She wrote later the poignant words, I do not think I am a natural born mother if I ever wanted to mother anyone, it was my father. <clears throat> I think the point that, that I really want most to convey is that given those emotional absences and losses of Grandmere's childhood, it's all the more remarkable that she developed such a vivid capacity for sustained close love and friendship as she grew through her adult life. I think of her deep friendship with Lorena Hickok, whom we all knew as Hick, with Joe Lash, who would become her first biographer, and later with her physician and confidant, David Gurevich, as well as her many longtime friends. Esther Lape, Molly Dusen, Isabella Greenway, Justine Wise Pullier. Well, there's of course one relationship that I've left out. I I wouldn't try to summarize it this morning. The most important and complex relationship in her adult life with her husband Franklin, but there's no doubt in my mind that it was a profound and knowing, if sometimes stressful, alliance. Well, why stressful? She was a compassionate and canny political and social activist. She understood it. She supported him. She sought his support. <coughs> and she knew that she wasn't burdened with the responsibilities and the limits of the presidency. They shared the same, fundamentally, the same humane liberal vision for this country and for the world. If she sometimes provoked impatience, there's a, I'm, I think, mythical 
um, prayer that is alleged to have been um, remarked by FDR. Oh, Lord, make Eleanor slow down. <laughs> she always consulted him. And often enough, she responded to his requests and, and uh, his needs in a way that he could or would not. I think of the remarkable address that she gave to the 1940 Democratic Convention, and especially of, especially of her strong support for the nascent civil rights movement. There was a basket, um, allegedly in his bedroom, I, can't, I confess I can't, uh, I, that I never saw it, but there was a basket for appeals and information from her. A basket that was seldom empty. <laughs> On balance, I really would say that more than any other single one of his advisors, she enriched his conduct of the presidency. So if I've, in, in this account of her childhood, um, mostly her losses, I, I want to revisit just for a moment the gifts of those early years that nourished her growth into the woman that she became. So, for example, however frequent and long her father's absences, their love for each other was real. She may have romanticized him. She did romanticize him. Filled the gaps with fueled her imagination. The real father became a kind of fantasy father, a fantasy that one day, a fantasy that one day the two of them, he actually said this on the, on the, when he came to visit on the day of Anna Hall's death, that they would live together. And she had no idea if she was to be then the mother of her two brothers, um, but, the, but the two, father and daughter, would be together. And that spirit stayed in her heart. And there's another occasion um, when she offered a revealing comment about what she felt a strength of her adult years. These are her words. I remember the method by which a nurse taught me to sew when I was six. After I had darned a sock, she would take the scissors and cut out all that I had done, telling me to try again. This was very discouraging. <laughs> but it was good training. When people have asked how I was able to get through some of the very bad periods in my adult life, my later life, I've been able to tell them honestly that because of all this early discipline, I inevitably grew into a really tough person. <laughs> a really tough person. Yeah, it was true in the sense that she intended. She was able to withstand suffering, hardship, difficulty. She was strong. She responded vigorously to challenges. Jean Bethke Elstein wrote of it truly. For Roosevelt, Elstein said, being a lady and being tough was no contradiction in terms. <laughs> and her explicit fusing of the two turned older understandings inside.
And then for three years, this is the White House years. This is actually, I fancy, I'm not absolutely sure it was true, the family dinner, family plus, however many people we had living in the White House. When my, I was sitting at the other end of the table, it's the only child, youngest, my grandfather, saying, Johnny, I think you'd like a drumstick, right? <laughs> I said, yes, Papa. I'm sure he had a, someone with a silver tray waiting to receive the drumstick. Instead, he took the drumstick and <laughs> flipped it down the table. I, and more in self-defense than anything else, I just put up a big linen napkin. And his, his aim was so on the mark that it hit the center of that linen napkin. <laughs> but what I was about to say was that for three years, there was Allenswood. Allenswood was probably the greatest early gift to her growth into the woman that she became. When she was turning 15, Grandmother Hall sent her to an English boarding school headed by a strong, sensitive, and deeply learned French woman, Marie Souvestre. And her time at Allenswood, and I think her, particularly her relationship with Mademoiselle Souvestre, nourished a vitality and independence of mind, a new confidence in relationships with her peers, and most notably, Sylvester also stimulated her social and her political consciousness, reinforcing that central guiding principle. How is she going to flesh out that wish for real useful? I think that's probably the best way to understand a comment by another of her close friends, Isabella Greenway, who wrote, even at that age, life had, through her orphanage, touched her and made its mark in a certain aloofness from the careless ways of youth. <coughs> the world had come to her as a field of responsibility rather than as a playground. Doesn't mean she was never playful. But she did experience the world as a field of responsibility. And finally, there, there's, a, there's a second, I mentioned her sense of humor, there, there's a second important element in Eleanor Roosevelt's life and spirit that has too often been overlooked by her biographers. I mean her Christian understanding and practice, with the emphasis on practice. It may have been only, it, it may have been the only subject on which she and, and uh, Marie Souvestre disagreed. In a conversation with a friend, uh, I remember um, my grandmother said of, of Marie Souvestre, she simply refused to acknowledge that she was following standards that she hadn't invented. <laughs> She was following love, and that is to follow God. Well, she abandoned the severe religiosity of her grandmother Hall throughout her whole life until the very last days. <coughs> 
she kept her habits of regular evening prayer at her bedside and her church attendance. In one of her books, she wrote, we don't begin to approach a solution to our problems until we acknowledge the fact that they are spiritual. A spiritual, moral awakening. Is that a fantasy? Well, yes and no. A hope. When I was living at Hyde Park, there's a very long dirt driveway. And um, I, well, I used to drive her to church, um, and mostly, I confess, in the, in the early years, um, out of a realization that no one else who was visiting wanted to go. But, and also that she was sometimes, what should, what should I call it, an inattentive driver. <laughs> Franklin Jr. in a, in a uh, generous moment of what I also would call compromised consciousness <laughs> had given her a little Fiat Spider sports car. So she would drive up to the end of the driveway. We'd be engaged by then in, in some pretty intense conversation. But she would dutifully look to the left. We'd continue the conversation. She'd look to the right. She wasn't entirely um, aware that there was probably a full minute between the first and the second. And we were coming on to Highway 9G, not exactly a country road, but there were no accidents. But she did sometimes drive like the proverbial bat out of hell. I was moved that I didn't discover this until the morning after her funeral, when we all gathered at her house, my family and I, and, and I walked into her bedroom, um, which I didn't do typically when she was alive, and I saw by her bedside the, the prayer that is attributed to St. Francis, and says a great deal about her spirit. Listen to the, uh, listen to the, the you, you, several of you will know it, but listen to the, pair, the, pairs, the pairs of words, for they describe, I think, the character and the radiance of her spiritual practice and its centrality in her private and public life. Here is the prayer. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Granted that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying. I think she meant this literally 
but one could also understand it metaphorically. It is in dying that we are born to life. Gromer has been gone now for more than half a century. Keeping up with my pictures. That's Marie Silvestre. Well, this this is such an iconic picture for me. It's a it's a snap, you can tell. But it's you know right now I'm thinking of it in relation to her passing on. She is still traveling. <laughs> I'm convinced. She's on the tarmac of an airport, carrying her own suitcase, a newspaper tucked under her other arm having just passed through gate, what is it, 1A? <laughs> I have in my home, across the bay, um, a replica of a, a miniature replica, re replica of a beautiful statue of her whose original stands at the southern tip of Riverside Park in New York City. Can you gather it? She's considerably in shadow, but it is so reflective of her character. I have another photo of that, that statue. A couple of years ago, probably I would guess around the time of the inauguration of Donald Trump, there was, as you know, a march upon Washington. So some enterprising soul, a woman I know, <laughs> climbed up the statue and added just the right touch. <laughs>